It's indeed wonderful to be back with FOAID and particularly encouraging to see uh, this new format and the manner in which they have adapted to the current times that we live in. And adaptation is actually at the core of what we will be discussing today. Adaptation to new findings from science and research, but also over the next few days, we have some very interesting conversations about adapting and adopting lighting design into the architectural design process. Today, however, we will be focusing on how biodynamic light both stimulates the senses and our performance. And to help us to navigate through this very fascinating and intriguing topic, I have a wonderful, informed, and experienced set of panelists. Um, architect Virendra Vaklu was born in Kashmir, grew up in Bhagalpur, studied architecture in Germany at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and then inspired by Indian architects Charles Correa, B.B. Doshi, and U.C. Jain, he returned to India in 1987 in search for that unique Indian identity. He then founded Matra, a very successful multi-awarded firm in 1990, where he uses this cross-cultural material and the logic of construction to search for this archetypal form. He has also taught architectural students and has guided many to pursue true dialogue, through sketching, through models, to resolve both context and form. Today, Virain will give us an architectural and design context to the discussion. To help us understand better the connection between light and well-being, it is my distinct pleasure to invite our next panelist, Dr. Shelley Jane, who wears many hats. Trained in textile design, she's handled corporate design strategies for some of the biggest names in the industry. She's also an experienced professional artist that applies science to her art in glass. She has qualified in lighting design and electrical installations and an international career that sort of combines consultancy with client servicing and public engagement, along with teaching and scientific research. But relevant to our discussions today, She's an international expert on light and well-being with a PhD from the Royal College of Arts, but with a unique distinction of delivering more content in a single sentence than the average person delivers in 10. A very warm welcome. The first of our two qualified, experienced architectural lighting designers in the panel is Dr. Amardeep Dugar, a trained architect and an advocate for all the elements of lighting, design, education, and research. He's also a trained architect. And after completing his master's degree in Germany in architectural lighting, he then went on to pursue a PhD in New Zealand to solidify his academic and professional leadership roles. He has also worked in Germany as a lighting designer. And his work has led to a lot of international recognition and a plethora of awards, including being named the Outstanding Young Scientist and being voted into a very respected top 40 under 40 list of lighting designers in 2017. Uh, in the time that he's not working, he relaxes um, doing yoga and teaching yoga. Beautiful background, Amar, today. And today he will be looking at some of bringing his international experience to discuss with us both the design and the research approach. The fourth member of our panel is Ms. Harshit, <coughs> an architect and principal lighting designer at Light Inspired Thinking. Harshita too has obtained her master's in lighting design from Germany. And after doing her specialization in interior lighting design in Italy, she then went on to work with some of the very prominent lighting design studios in Dubai and in London, and then went on to form, uh, found Light Inspired Thinking. Uh, based in Bangalore, they provide expert lighting design consultation for hospitality, residential, and commercial projects. Today, Harshita represents the dynamic young breed of Indian lighting designer in our panel, educated, trained, experienced, and raring to go. Welcome, Harshita. Thank you. <laughs> so we will quickly jump into our discussion, the impact of biodynamic lighting. It's a large topic, multifaceted. How does it affect us both physiologically and psychologically? We cannot deal with everything in one hour. But what we will be looking at in a lot more detail is, are we taking these effects 
of light for granted? Are we ignoring it in our design discussions for our habitable spaces? Should we be giving it more importance in our design dialogue, both with our client as well as with our end users? So to start, I'd like to address the first question to Viren. Viren, from an architectural point of view, you know, we have grown up with this traditional light forming an integral part of the whole design process. When we look at historical evidence in India of old temples and palaces, or in the modern world, you know, we respect architects like Khan and Corbusier, more recently Zumthor and Novell, who have given light this very important place in that whole design process. So I will actually just be running through six slides and encouraging you to sort of just capture this journey that we have seen in, you know, traditionally in architecture, that design process and where light was sort of integrated in that process. I could observe looking at the history uh, of architecture and certainly the history of architecture is very closely linked uh, to the history of light and lighting. And uh, I'll be showing some uh, insight into daylighting and the evolution of these two very distinct paradigms and their continuity into today's architectural uh, engagements. Um, interesting is that most of these engagements were around secret architecture initially. And I think that's understandable because it requires a certain economy to generate these models, which were available only in the earlier periods for churches, for temples, and later only they migrated. These, this knowledge that came out of understanding uh, the domain of lighting, later they migrated into uh, forts, palaces, even into, uh, into residential architecture, as we know. Uh, but it's very important to understand that the history of uh, daylight, integration of daylight into architecture is also the history of um, structural evolution and uh, the knowledge of material and the progression of use of material the temples in Hampi that engaged themselves very strongly in modulating the light uh, by having a set of columns that generates the periphery around the Garbhgri, which is the uh, sanctum sanctorium of the temple. Interesting is, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the pictures that are come popping up, but interesting in this uh, paradigm is that uh, the daylight from the, from the experience of the outer world and the experience as you approach the temple gets modulated by the set of these columns. It gets broken by the set of columns and courtyards and you migrate actually into the sacred zone of the garb gray. Now, the architecture and the modulation of light goes in, in hand with the understanding of and having the worldview and the ideology towards our cosmos. So the inward journey from light to darkness is very pertinent in temple architecture. And this remains actually till date uh, the key of, of understanding why temple, why, uh, why the garb gray in the temple is a very dark zone. In fact, one would uh, one would put probably the question across that before there is light, there is always darkness and not the other way. So I think the entire development of the earth would have started with darkness and then moved towards sound and light. Um, if we put against this sacred architecture, the Western model, and uh, I had a beautiful picture of the, the cathedral in Chartres. Uh, it, shows, it shows interestingly uh, not a journey that goes inward, but a journey, and most of us would have experienced that entering a cathedral, that the journey in a cathedral is towards, it's upwards, it's upward lifting, as if the, 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 the domain of the divine is the sky, and not downward or into the womb of a place, like in the Garb plane. So this is a very interesting paradigm because it, tries to it tries to give significance to 
light emerging and you see that in cathedral through through the uh, introduction of uh, the clear story you see through the introduction of the stained glass that uh, that occupies huge surface of the structure and that attempts to dissolve even i would i would put that across the surface of uh, the the solids it tries to dissolve into being a complete abode of light now one would understand in the earlier periods unlike today we we don't have the quality of glass so the glass itself is a medium that is opaque has a certain opacity has then additionally the narrative of uh, the the biblical narratives uh, uh, painted on them and the entire glass structure itself since the size was not available has a interlaced structure this interlaced structure is also reflected in the structure of the cathedral so that's given us a, a nice kind of overview that is sort of allowed yeah. us to see this progression and how light has sort of integrated into the building yeah. so we have and to imagine that linus so you know the yes. dark temple the dark deep temple mass and very orthogonal structural system while the cathedral yeah. is trying to move up certainly i will come later to that we should not miss on the 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 development of the islamic architecture vis-a-vis -vis handling light um i'll come the to that little role later. that sort of modulation uh that was uh, available with uh, different mechanisms so either it would be the jali mashrabia that would sort of be integrated into the building pattern to control yeah. the amount of light entering into the building space yeah, yeah i that's that great overview for us to sort of kick off this discussion Shall I and, go for uh, Shall I, I go think, into the modern time? Or? Um, yeah, I think let's move on, uh, Viren, just so that we get uh, various people's interpretation on this right now. Okay. Um, Dr. Shelley, for you, I mean, in your research, right, for us as humans, indeed, well, most of the life on this planet, we have sort of looked at the sun for a variety of things. You know, it, it starts with light and warmth, but it's also healing and, you know, this critical trigger for timing our, our you know, cells in the body. Um, how would you look at your research and you know, these influences on daylight uh, in learning and in working? What have you found in your research over the last few years? It's a great pleasure to be here. And what a fascinating introduction there. I think, um, I suppose what Varen's introduction points to is the deep um, sort of emotional connection that we have with with light which brings us into a whole sort of metaphorical uh, spiritual philosophical question about about light and seeing but actually um i suppose what we're understanding is that there are two types when inside the eye there are two broad pathways one of them is the visual pathway and the other is the non-visual pathway and i suppose what's interesting about the way that we respond to light is about a set of expectations about sun rising in the morning, going down in the evening, it being properly dark at night. And we use our eyes and the visual system to work out where stuff is relative to ourselves. So there's a sort of temporal di dimension, the, the way that light falls on things further away allows us to see, I mean, there's um, objects which are further away in space look don't look so bright, for example. There are all sorts of ways in which um, light affects our ability to navigate in the world. It helps us to work out what stuff looks like, um, whether it's good to eat. So there are lots and lots of powerful things that sunlight does for us um, that we, when we live in artificial light, some of those mechanisms of expectation and navigation, both sort of temporal and spatial, are, are confounded or confused in, in interesting ways. Um, some of them fine, some of them not so fine. And then we have the non-visual pathway, which is our ability to work out what time of day and night it is. And that pathway doesn't form images, it, it forms a sense of the time of day and it's it's very sensitive to shifts in a particular part of the spectrum, which is called the melanopic um, part of the spectrum, which is these high energy blue wavelengths, which tell our brain it's time to get out there and get out there. And there's a whole set of um, cascade of extraordinary, subtle and powerful um, systems, not only within 
the, the, the brain and the body, but also within the eye itself, which means, for example, that light at night has more impact than light during the day on the way our bodies are working. Um, it also means that particularly for learning and working, there are particular times of the day which are great for some things and really not that good for others. So, for example, uh, if you're ever trying to sort of fit in some exercise in your day, you sort of think you're going to go for a run early in the morning, but actually that's pretty much the worst time for you to be uh, to be exercising because your um, blood pressure is very high, your all sorts of other res reflexes and responses aren't that great. So if you want to get, um, if you want to learn things around between 10 and 12 o'clock, which is about now in here in the UK, um, is a great time to do that. If you want to be physically very strong and recover very well, afternoon is a better time for that. Um, so these, we also know that um, different ages are setting that clock. Their eyes are changing um, to notice different times of the day um, at different ages. So your teenager, um, they, 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 their body clock shifts by about an hour. So all of those, so we need to use the visual part of the uh, of the daylight in the visual part of the system to um, help us to navigate space, to feel comfortable in space and to understand the sort of emotional and sort of social dynamics of a space. Um, so we've looked at schools, for example, where um, having uh, Fagerholtz and some wonderful work where um, teachers have used overhead lights um, for kind of group work and then created sort of caves of light using pendants to um, invite students to sit quietly and learn together. Um, there's a very different kind of social interaction in those in those sort of cave-like spaces. So that's working on the on the visual system, we know that um, people choose foods differently uh, depending on the color rendering index of the space they're in. So daylight is designed to help us, well, our, our bodies are designed to take the visual spectrum of um, daylight and see which foods are good to eat. And we also notice facial expressions that way. Uh, so then there's the non-visual system, uh, which is sort of finely tuned to daylight as well. And I think the last, my bottom line would be to just make sure there's dark as well as light. I think Varen made an interesting point about how there is no light without dark and um, whether that be to do with shadows or actually getting proper night's sleep. Um, the absence of daylight is, is probably just as important as the daylight itself. So uh, that's I suppose that's my, my quick canter through uh, why daylight is so powerful and so important to us. Yeah, so that's uh, very comprehensive. Some key takeaways from there being that light across the time of day has different influences on the body for sure. The second takeaway being that each one of us is probably responding differently to that light, right? Depending on how we are living our lives. Interesting. Uh, Amar, you're experiencing daylight right now in all its hues and wonders uh, out <laughs> on your balcony. But as a lighting designer and a researcher, You've, I, I know you've done a lot of research and theoretical study into, you know, spaces and optimizing the use of natural daylight and then sort of complementing it with artificial daylight to help us, you know, celebrate our spaces and uh, live healthily, um, look after ourselves, right? How has this particular aspect of light over the time of day influenced your design dialogue? You know, when you're when you're discussing the design process with your client, with your end user, has this been a part of that discussion and how have you used it in your design? Excellent question, uh, Linus. I hope you're able to hear me now. Yes. Uh, just just taking the points from where uh, architect Brain had mentioned and Dr. Shelley had mentioned. Uh, research knowledge is there. There's a lot of knowledge that is available. But uh, how do you make it uh, more easily comprehensible to the end user? Because they're not going to be understanding if I go tell them melanopic lux and melatonin levels and all these kind of uh, um, jargon, which I go tell them, they're not going to be understanding it. And I'll tell yeah. you one very simple example that I got to do. With. I was doing a hospitality uh, lighting project and we were designing the uh, mock-ups for these individual rooms because they had these uh, executive suite rooms and they had these standard rooms, they had these double king rooms and what all and what not. And there was this main discussion about uh, having a night lamp because they said uh, the client was very well aware that there needs to be a night lamp at a very low level so that when the client wants to use the toilet, he could just switch on that light so they will not disturb the other person sleeping next to him and can go visit the toilet. 
And I said, yes, that's excellent. That's excellent that you need to have that. But one of the engineers who were there said, oh, you need to have a blue night lamp. Now, the researcher that I am, what, I've, what we have learned, and I'm sure Dr. Shelley will agree, blue light is the most highest frequency after violet light. Highest frequency of light means that it's got a lot more energy and it does tend to disturb our brain and sleep patterns. Blue light is very good to keep us more awake and active. So it's a very good for visual equity, for visual comfort, for visual, um, for, for concentration. You want to work in an office, you don't want to go off to sleep. That's the best thing to use a bluish white, blue tinged light. But trying to put a blue light as a night lamp, you're going completely against what it is. And so that's where I had to actually go and explain to the client in a very simple manner that there's blue light and there's red light. And blue light tends to be have a very higher frequency. If it's higher frequency, it means that it's going to disturb your sleep pattern a lot more. And a red light has got a much lower frequency that it's much easier and uh, smoother and calmer. Too. So you have a warm light, it's much better, or a red light or an amber light as a night lamp it'll be much better for you to go not disturb your sleep patterns. The client found this very interesting. And then he said that uh, he had his own couple of hotels. And he said, there's one hotel property that I have. I'm just not able to sleep at night. Can you go and have a look at that? Interestingly, I did go and visit that property. And what I did find out that was the alarm clock had a blue light display. The air conditioning had a blue light display. It had the TV remote and TV had a small uh, LED light and had a blue light display. And the whole room, when you switch off all the lights, it was just flooded with all these blue lights all around. And it all said that this is the reason why you're not able to sleep. So I hope you now try and understand why you're not able to sleep in this property is because of the use of blue light. So it's just hardcore, th Theory, hardcore research, which has been applied in a very simple, simplistic manner to make the client understand. And it so happened that in future, all his projects that I've been working on, he has banned blue lights and he's also asking for red displays for the air conditioner, red displays for the TV. And when he buys a TV property, he says, does it have a blue or a red display LED? So that has been a very good education for the client and trying to bring research education to a practical, more easily understandable way of making the end user and the client understand. So that I would say was a good way of looking at it. Interesting, probably one of the best rooms to wake up in, but not necessarily <laughs> the best room to go to sleep in. <laughs> yes, not to, See, not that's, to the, that's the way. Right? Uh, it, you know, it has its usefulness as uh, Dr. Shelley has explained, different frequencies for different times of day. It's just important in this lighting dialogue discussion to sort of bring in the right aspect for the right application. And I think uh, this is a good point to bring Harshita into the discussion because Harshita, you have worked in a lot of different, uh, with a lot of different cultures, in a lot of different time zones, uh, in England, in Dubai, in India. What has been your experience, um, firstly, with regard to this approach to not just the intensity of light, you know, there are certain preferences for people who want brighter light in their spaces, some that want a slightly dimmer approach. Uh, there are those that want the cooler color temperatures. There are those that are more comfortable in the warmer color temperatures. How, do, how have you sort of seen this in your uh, design approach in your different areas where you have worked? How personalized has this choice been and how has it affected your design making decisions? Uh, it's a very interesting question, Linus. Um... I'm thinking, how do I answer this without sort of generalizing people to uh, categories? But uh, let me take a shot at this. So yes, I mean, I've been very lucky to live in different parts of the world, uh, in India, in Bangalore, Ahmedabad, in Dubai, in London, in Germany, in, even in Mozambique and Milan. And I interacted as a lighting designer. I was interacting a lot with people there. And the main discussion around light would be the preference to the color of light. Do you want white light or do you want, I mean, in layman's term, they would say white light or yellow light. Is it, do, do they want bright light or a dim light, right? And this has been something that a lot of people tend to ask you about and a lot of uh, uh, strong opinions that uh, people seem to have about it. So if I had to generally tell you, I what I noticed was that in cooler regions, people seem to like, especially, especially for residential projects, 
they seem to like dimmer dimmer uh, light and a warmer color tone which is closer to the flame of you know a warmer tone of light which is closer to the flame flame wow. and people in a in the uh, you know warmer regions like a cooler color tone so maybe closer to a blue sky and again you can't generalize but i think it's it's a lot to do with the cultural background a lot to do with the geographical preferences over there uh i also feel like maybe in cooler countries they're so used to you know these incandescent bulbs beautiful chandeliers gas lighting so you sort sort of associate warm color to a feeling of homeliness and intimacy and in in warmer regions uh because you get so much daylight right the blue light and you're exposed to so much light in the day that a lot of our clients come and tell us okay i want my house to look bright and i want it to look like how it does in the day and so this is an interesting place for us to start but when i was practicing what i've always felt is uh, listen to the client and listen to the client carefully okay so if the client is sort of telling me that i want a uh, cold white light i want white light for my bedroom and i want it to be really bright i think it's important as a lighting designer to understand what is he saying uh, he doesn't have the technical terms maybe he's not even referring to the color of light he's saying i want cool light maybe what he's trying to say is that i want an ambience which doesn't look dull i don't want a dramatic ambience i don't want a dimly lit room so maybe that's what he's saying and so how we would uh, sort of address it is maybe we would provide good vertical illumination right so that the room looks brighter so even if you're using a warmer color temperature if you're lighting up the walls the space feels brighter and again talking about intense uh, can you hear me yes we can go ahead and instead of having one intense source of light again you could have uh, multiple layers of light which creates the same amount of brightness so i think a lot of it is to understand what the client wants if he's saying i want a brightly lit room it's not only about the color temperature because i i, I mean as uh, dr shelly and uh, uh, dr amar have indicated also using the wrong color temperature of light when especially in when you're places where you're sleeping or where you want to relax uh it's require you need to educate the client a bit more and tell them that this may not be the best lighting for you to feel more calm and relaxed of course it's really good if you're in a workplace and you want to feel alert and active so you, then you use cooler tones of light and another way of looking at it is at it is also that um the interior dictates a lot of our selections so for example if you're using wood if you're using brass if you're using bronze if you're using gold yes use warm color tones but if you're using like concrete if you're using cement blue or you know cooler tones of light then i i would tell them you know use the cooler tone of light so i think it's a lot about exchange of knowledge and of course what the um end user wants is important but i think it's uh, it also depends on how the interior uh, finishes of the space is designed like nice nicely captured so it's it's about a detailed design dialogue Yeah. it's about understanding as much uh, about what the client wants but it's also about understanding how you bring your interpretation and your training and experience to understanding how that light interacts with that material to make a more composed a better environment a happier environment for that client yeah, yeah. i think that's pretty much uh, one of the focus areas of you know where lighting designers sort of integrate into this design process by initiating that dialogue and sort of carrying it through with their understanding of the material and and the space in fact um virain very often we have sort of had these discussions on how you know material sort of impacts light how your built form sort of uh, allows that light integration uh, both at the natural level of daylighting in the space as well as the artificial light and i think it's very important uh, before we bring you in on the next question just to make sure that you know we see the visuals of what you were talking about because i'd like you now to sort of complete your discussion you know uh, of that transition and take us into how you yourself have you know designed projects that you have done um, integrating this light so here we um, had humpy with the sacred space the garb gray which is dark the dark interior of the temple the darkest interior and on the left side you see the transitional spaces that that modulate then the glare of the light gradually into the darkness so that you are not hit by a surprise i think it's very important to to see the dilation of your eyes along with 
with the composition of the spaces. Here, the, the, the church in Chartres, you see already uh, the, the lattice work and the, the very refined work that is then gradually disappearing and dematerializing uh, the mass in a, in a church here. Next. And interestingly is, and this project is, I think, all across the world well known. It is uh, Corbusier's chapel uh, in Rochon. Um, and what he does, and I think there is a sudden change in the ideology. We are talking about mind being and the intellect being operated here and applied here in creating through the dialectic process, the, the mass, the mass versus the void. And I think, uh, Corbusier would have started with this chapel first as a dark space, as a pitch black space walled around and then almost with an axe cut the windows and allowed the, the almost like rain, that's what people describe this place. Light become has an entity suddenly. Light becomes a solid, a solidified uh, element piercing into the space. Uh, next. Um, Yes, we have, of course, also an Indian example with Doshi Sangat, where he tries to modulate the light through a sequence from the outside to the inside of his studio through a sequence of uh, differently lit spaces, of course, all with daylight. Um, and I shouldn't miss out. This is one of the remarkable contribution by the Islamic architecture, where with very little means and very little material, the material that is the, the body of the architecture, uh, that that material is through craftsmanship dissolved into a lattice, thus creating not only a play with light and darkness, but also creating climate, uh, climate moderations. Now, uh, John Nouvelle in Abu Dhabi with, with the latest museum for the Louvre has created this very paradigm, this very device uh, into the roof. Though in my opinion, arguably very, very expensive and uh, uh, not only expensive, very complex in geometry to achieve that what the Islamic architecture historically had achieved. Uh, that was to this point. Let me take it further now to my work. Uh, I feel the biggest challenge of working today in the, in the, in the present time for any architect is to connect internal spaces and external spaces uh, through light and through the vision that you get from the inside out. Here, this is a studio for the for the artist couple in Greater Noida, outskirt of Delhi, uh, where the client didn't want to look outside. There was not much to see, be seen. Plus, they wanted their studio to be very private against uh, onlookers. Um, what we did certainly then, uh, we, we tried to create very small punctures into the space and modulate the light in such a way, um, next, uh, such a way that we have a backdrop for the artist, which is then depicting the canvas, the canvas as a part of their working environment. Um, the other work, uh, and this continues in our work, that the internal uh, design process and the external form making or the shape making is one and the same methodology applied through and through and depicting then the requirement of a client. Very often, certainly we ignore the requirement of a client and rather take it because clients know that what they know. We know that we don't know much and therefore we explore into the realm that is new to us as well. So the path for me has been always from the known to the unknown and not the other way. So I feel, for example, in this little wood house, the dilemma that we face as architect is if you get a plot that looks towards the Himalayas, which are in the north, you will not get enough sunlight and you want to have sunlight to warm you up. But this dichotomy that you get can be very easily manipulated by having skylights. In this case, we have oriented the skylights towards the southeast because the southern part has again mountains that would shade the area. So we have both of the best. We get the sunlight from the southeast, but the view to the northern part. And we have tried then in the form making, tried to reflect on the, the, the mountains themselves as as a link between the building and the mountain and uh, creating an iconic kind of kind of building. Uh, this idea of looking out and and next, please 
looking out out of your window and getting yet a good light is being further elaborated here in an industrial area in Rurki, that's north part of India still, uh, where we try to develop an office with a linear skylight all along the building and create the main light source through the skylight that can be then seasonally manipulated with a very simple device like a louver because we know exactly how the seasons behave um, and yet have people look out of the office into the gardens by simply a device where the, the envelope itself gets dragged down very low, very low and allows the scorching sky from being uh, obstructed. I think that device has worked for us very well and of course i don't need to go further into structures and all but for us inside and outside spaces the form making is one and the same i think that's very important i think daylight as long as you can harness daylight for comfort should not be should not be manipulated by the artificial lighting i think the artificial lighting should kick in when there is a requirement unfortunately architects nowadays very unfortunate. I experience that daily. There's an interior designer and there is a facade designer. I feel it should be one and the same. Of course, interior designer kicks in when it comes to color renderings, to fabrics, to objects, to paintings, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Beautiful. Some lovely examples there, not just of... Uh, so it's not always about uh, daylight and daylight integration. It's also about the view that you get in from there. It's also about controlling temperature, allowing, you know, a, a sort of balance of all these various parameters, beautifully yeah. expressed in, in its built form. It's quite fascinating. And I think one of the things that has been touched on both in this discussion, and we hear it a lot, uh, when we are uh, sort of uh, going through these questions with clients is uh, our associations, you know, the way our brain sort of perceives space, understands light. I think, uh, Dr. Shelley, you have done uh, some uh, amount of your research has sort of focused on man and the reptilian brain, you know, and his association to maybe 10,000 years of uh, just the sun as the primary source of light and how that has sort of influenced his own sort of feeling for what is right and what is not so right. right? So how do you sort of see this thing, both in terms of the spectrum that we are dealing with, you know, the, the wavelengths, the, the, the various um, wavelengths or colors of light that come out from uh, our source of light, the sun, as well as this intensity, you know, how does this sort of tie into uh, proven performance and our feeling of well-being in spaces that are naturally daylit. Yeah. So it's a fascinating question, and what what beautiful examples of a sort of a sensitive handling of of light. Um, yeah. So if we're thinking about the way that our brains are really essentially sort of hardwired, in fact, from the first days of of life in the womb, our visual systems are, are sort of hard at work trying to work, sort of trying to define. To, to navigate through the world and in fact even the most simple single cell organisms are responsive to the direction of light and the color temperature and, and as you say the the intensity so i think that we are acutely sensitive to um the unnatural in light we're getting very good at um at living with it but i think that those sorts of ways that you're also mentioning um Actually, about um, creating different levels of light within within a space. So um, I think that we need to, as 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 architects, as, as scientists, as people who are passionate about health and well-being, find ways of creating environments which reflect or suggest those um, those ancient senses of where light should come from and what time of day it is, both in terms of the the visual the, the wavelengths that are available. So um, even if you have a cool what we call a, a cool or a white light or a warm light that there is a good range of spect of, of, of wavelengths in that light as you would get out of an incandescent lamp or out of the sun and then to make sure that the position of the lights um, are coherent because we, we get very confused if lights coming from below or it's coming from a from a location which 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 generates glare particularly as we get older and our eyes aren't quite so clear 
Um, so I think that if we just remember who we are, that we're animals, we're, some, we're creatures really trying to work out what time of day it is and what's what's good to eat and where things are, then we as, as designers and as people who are bringing other people into this understanding of the power of light, we, 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 we it's, it's, it's pretty much common sense. And I think what's brilliant now is that the technology is, is allowing us to do things like um, sen sensing switching light at different times of the day and generating light which is has a much better spectrum um, and doesn't flicker quite so much I think that we if as long as we go back to basics and think of ourselves as, as creatures trying to navigate ourselves in the world with very very powerful and sensitive clocks which we disrupt at our peril because we know that people who um, are exposed to particularly this very bright blue high energy wavelength at the wrong time of day they're more likely to get cancer they're more likely to um suffer from depression they're more likely to get overweight there are all kinds of ways in which um although we think it's fine um our bodies are, are reacting in ways that are pretty um which suggest a, a deep um, dissatisfaction or, or unease with the way that light is currently delivered in our buildings the artificial light so I'm right with uh, Varin about um, getting um, as much uh, daylight in there, but also making sure that we get enough darkness as well. So I'd love to know how, I haven't seen any blinds on your lights there. I mean, so I, I think we, we do, it, it's really important that these beautiful modern buildings, they've got gorgeous big lights. And actually, particularly for a rental generation, there's no way of making it dark. Um, and these lights look gorgeous and these buildings look gorgeous on the outside, all these kind of super bright. We are destroying, I mean, the reptiles, the, the nocturnal animals um, and the insects with our kind of um, gluttony for light. And I think that's something else that I'd like to invite us to, to reflect on is that we are part of an ecology. And if this current um, uh, situation has taught us anything is that we are um, we are all interconnected and that so, so we need to deal with our own reptilian brains, but also be aware of how our um, love of of, of bright lights literally um, can can be harmful to other other reptiles, our fellow reptiles on this earth. So uh, that's my little plea for darkness, if I can. <laughs> Lovely. Yes, of course, we are all connected. And, and not as we'd like to think of us humans as being the only species that sort of occupy the planet and we need to only focus on ourselves. Every now and then sort of nature sends in this little reminder to just let us know that, you know, we have to take care of the planet as a composite whole, you know. And um, I think I might just make about the reptilian brain. I mean, what we also know, for example, is that um, people who are surviving um, this virus um, tend to be people who have spent have have higher levels of vitamin D, for example. So I think that that's another really powerful part of our skin. Is 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 a really valuable asset in our in our in our sensing of of light. So um, I think, again, being aware of the kind of systemic impact of light and bringing daylight into buildings, thinking about um, neo, well, all kinds of hospitals, particularly um, neonatal wards and hospitals which deal with mental health issues. We know that if people get good quality daylight, um, they recover more quickly, they eat better, the whole thing, um, there's a kind of a virtuous circle there of, of, of everybody being lifted up. So I think that bringing daylight into um, into therapeutic and, and educational settings is, is really, really important. I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, precisely, because we, we sort of seem to consider light as just one of those single property items which just help us to do work better and forget about the curative aspect of light, you know, how it's actually helping us to be better. But uh, what I find particularly interesting in this understanding, as, as we are trying to sort of navigate through the times that we exist in, I also find it very interesting to look at the standards and the way the standards have sort of changed over a period of time. And uh, Amar, I would like to bring you in on this discussion on, you know, the way we have approached design in the industrial era, where we were focused more on productivity and how efficient a person was. And then we sort of moved into this energy equation and our standards sort of started defining how much energy we consume and how can we limit the amount of energy that we consume. But today, interestingly, as we have just been discussing, you know, it is about the person who is at the center of, who should be in the center of this whole design discussion. And we are now seeing new standards emerge for sort of well-being. 
Um, very often they're still sort of centered around the human, but I think they're also extending it now. We've begun to understand the effect on animals and plant life. What has been your experience and what has been your understanding of these, the way the standards have sort of evolved and how we are using them in our design discussions? Now, uh, this, this is something which has been disturbing me for quite some time because uh, like um, Dr. Shelley had mentioned about this gluttony for life. So I was just trying to understand um, why is it that this human being is so human centric and it's always about. So a look, uh, just a little bit look at the history about 100 years ago, this whole thing about industrial era. What was there was, it was not the industrial era, it was the industrial economy. So everything was all about mass production. Then about another 30 years later came the consumer economy. Consumer economy was about mass production and selling, and people, it was so bad. It became so bad that people just kept buying, buying, and then the the advertisements at those times were like, "It's okay to throw away things and buy new, throw away things." So it was just about consuming and throwing it away and creating piles and piles of of, of junk. Next, a little bit later, came the knowledge economy again. So knowledge economy is all about the IT, how knowledge can be capitalized and taking into things. So everything was about economy, nothing about ecology, nothing about equity. So it was all about driven by economy. So that's where all this comes, just to the money. And then early 2007 with the internet revolution, a thing began to human economy. And that's when people started trying to question this whole lifestyle. There were people like Greta Thunberg, we've all heard how a teenager started challenging this whole thing with the internet revolution, trying to say what, how we need to start living better. So yes, the idea is to decouple design decisions from economy. So this whole gluttony is all about economy because they want to create light because they want to make more business. So the idea is to decouple economy from design decisions and trying to focus on design so that you have uh, the culture, you have the individual, you have the social cultural values, and then you try to bring in environment and try to bring a very good paradigm. And I, it's, it's, uh, there are different names to this. I call it a paradigm called slow design where everything is slowing down to focus on social, cultural, um, human, and environmental economy. And that's where the standards need to bring in. And I would say we are moving more towards a wellness scheme. But my fear now is that there are these economies, they're going to bring in something called the wellness economy. And then they try to make money out of wellness. Because now what they do is they all sell this concept of human-centric lighting. And what is it about human-centric lighting? You just change color temperature from 4,000 to 3,000 Kelvin. That is not human-centric. Come on. I mean, you need to move economy away from all of design. So that is where the gluttony of human being has to move away. We need to bring in, and I'm glad you named this session as biodynamic. If you had said human-centric lighting, I would have said I want to be a part of it. So I'm glad you did that. And it's a lot more inclusive. We are trying to include all living beings of this planet because everybody has a right to live on this earth. Human beings are there, but then we need animals. We have the birds, we have the insects and the plants behind me, the trees behind me, and they all come into this whole economy. And that's when we have this well-being standard where we have, how does my facade lighting affect the tree that is being planted outside my house? That is when a standard has achieved its. How is the facade lighting affecting the bees around my house in my garden? How is it affecting the bats around my house? And that's when you call a well-being standard because it talks about well-being of human beings, about animals, about insects, about plants, the entire biodiversity and economy is outside the standard. So that is what I would say would be the next way to looking at it. Yes, quite effectively put across. Uh, all the boxing gloves are now out. But uh, interestingly, it is, um, you know, almost proven by fact that you actually refocus on these things and the economy will do well. You know, it is just that we have exactly, to start exactly. From economy is always a byproduct and it always follows. Economy follows wherever there is well-being. And that is yeah. something which we as human beings need to unlearn and learn again. Economy is just a byproduct. It happens. If you're happy, economy follows. And more interestingly, uh, as we will be discussing in another panel discussion later on, it's not just about us 
alone in on this particular planet, which is the only planet that we have. But even in controlling the amount of light that we push out into the sky, we are actually losing touch of our place in the universe, right? So it's even including that whole night sky pollution that we have sort of ended up doing just to make our buildings look good. But how do you think, Harshita, uh, as a lighting designer practicing from, you know, uh, the very Richard Kellyan principles of, um, you know, ambient uh, light, a little bit of focal glow and some play of brilliance. Today, we have sort of, we are bringing this, we are allowing this evolution of design in our built spaces. What about for us as lighting designers, for you as a practicing emerging lighting designer doing projects, how has this changed for you? If I, if I keep for a moment the play of brilliance out of it, if we look at the two fundamentals of, you know, uh, the ambient light and the focal glow, how have we sort of adapted this to our new modern designs of our internal spaces? So firstly, Linus, I think uh, Richard Kelly's principles of light, uh, I mean, for lighting designers, it's solid. Like even till today, it's it's great, right? Accent lighting to create focus, to create hierarchy, and then general lighting to provide overall illumination. So this is th these principles. And of course, visual delight to, you know, create visual interest and, you know, uh, uh, curiosity. And I think these are principles that all of us could be using today, even 50, 60 years uh, from the advent of the principles. Uh, and also Richard Kelly also spoke about how, you know, the architecture should dictate how the lighting, how, you know, the architecture is first and the lighting just follows. And also he spoke a lot about how daylight is the primary source of light and artificial light should just add to this to just enhance the space as and when required. So if we look and but today, if we have to see one element or some things that are missing from what Richard Kelly's principles you know, dictated uh, to us was, I mean, with the uh, with all this new knowledge and technology that we're having, the one thing I feel like we're learning is the human aspect of it. Uh, I think that was what is missing in the principles initially. Uh, it's that we, we don't talk much about how light interacts with human beings, about how artificial light is uh, creating the non-visual effect of light, right? How does it affect a person? So today, when we design, we are more conscious about not only the visual effect of light, but the non-visual effect of light. So, and I think as lighting designers, we're trying, so I think the best thing about daylight, I mean, uh, is the fact that it's ephemeral, right? It's changing, it's fleeting, it's not gonna be the same. And as lighting designers today, I think we really try to uh, mimic this quality of light in our uh, interior spaces that we are working to working at. And of course, it's it's almost impossible, right, to create these ephemeral effects. But of course, there are things which you can control, right? Like with the advent of lighting controls, you know, you have such great li lighting controls, and you have automation, so that you're able to automatically change the scene in a space from maybe a cool white in the day. Uh, to a warmer tone and then a, another a warmer tone in the night or for example there's the warm dim technology right so for example if you're in a, if you're in a restaurant uh, the warmer it gets the dimmer the light gets so again it's sort of a sort of mimicking the nature right you're trying to understand how can you bring in that element inside and also the, uh, the the feel of you know the intensity of light, right? Uh, you you can have daylight sensor which you know sort of dim down the light automatically. Uh, so I think this is uh, this is one thing which we have at our disposal today is the you know the new technology that's come in and we're able to be more sensitive uh, to how we design, right? Like we 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 should consider how light should not be static it should be dynamic it should change so that there is uh, you know a sense of relief and you know interest when you're working in in a, in a space or at home and i think that's how uh, i would try to you know uh, do my projects also thanks harshita yeah. insightful um, and i think just in the interest of time before we sort of wrap up i'd like to just allow the panel to sort of help us go and get a little sneak preview of the future. And I think, uh, uh, Shelly, you have a little bit of a time constraint, but if you could just lead this discussion. Uh, for this last round, what I'd like to do is I'd like uh, to talk about the future from our panel experts. Um, Shelly would be addressing how she sees uh, technology sort of intervening and oh, where will we go with this new technology? 
And what I would like to do is have Harshita respond to Dr. Shelley's uh, insights. And then I would like to bring Viren in to see where is this sort of the design dialogue going with regard to architecture and have Amardeep respond to that, right? So um, Dr. Shelley, if you could just lead the way and let us know what do you see as changing in the future and how is that going to help us? I think we all, you were mentioning earlier about our sort of gluttony actually um, like like reptiles, we will we will gorge on fat and sugar because in the part in sort of in evolutionary terms, you kind of take it while you can. And I think that's been our downfall in terms of lighting as well. So I think that it's I mean, and I'm currently wearing um, this one. Um, uh, uh, it's a little light sensor uh, by a, 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 and you start up and I've got it with an app and it's telling me how much I've and I've got another app for how much I've eaten um, in calories as well. So what it's doing is. Um, Kind of helping me to want to sort of curb my own reptile brain and it's kind of hunger for for the kind of red bull or the kind of diet coke of, of bright light so i think that's something that we're going to see in the future but also as we get older my eyes are um they will only take in about half as much light as, as my 10 year old niece's light eyes so i think that over time we're going to get these sorts of pieces of technology which are going to allow us to manage our um, appetite for, for light in different ways and support us to be um, to kind of use it as we would food or exercise to be happier and happier. I mean, the downside of that is that we are going to find ourselves um, possibly um, even more antisocial and even more isolated than we were before because heck I need this light because you know my thing is so and actually you know I'm not <laughs> we become less and less collective in our experience of light but it's the opposite extreme of those sort of spiritual journeys into light that we have in old collective building um i think another trend is that we are i mean you we're all sort of i'm in a spare room i mean we're all working from a home now so i think that the way we light our buildings um will need to be much more flexible much more versatile moving from um sort of a social or an intimate space into a workspace into um, a family space um public and private are mixing in interesting ways so i think that the old ways we thought about um healthy lighting we need to shift and we used to delegate that sort of healthy lighting to an employer and now we we have to kind of be much more active in our understanding of the way we're lighting our own buildings our own domestic spaces and i think also, I'm seeing a rental generation coming through where one of the only things you can change in your space is your light. So I can imagine in the future um, bringing your own lighting environment with you in the shape of a sort of a, a pack of a pack of light bulbs in the same way that you used to bring um, a trousseau of, um, of uh, linen as a, as, a, as a young married person in the future. So I think this idea of um, versatility and I think also um, the final thing I will say is particularly this next generation are brilliantly and powerfully committed to the environment. So I think the idea about the life cycle of the products that we use, this idea of kind of chucking away lights and drivers and, and all of that, the amount of um, waste uh, and the conversation about um, sort of watts per lumen, you know, kind of power per output of light, I think, is going to shift and I really hope it does sooner rather than later into not sort of how much bang for your buck but actually um, what the, the the quality rather than the quantity of light that you're getting for the energy that you're putting in um, and and switching it off I hope in the future is going to be as important a message as, as switching it on so that's my, my my two pence worth for the future five pounds I'd say uh, <laughs> so lots for you to comment on uh, we've got the fact of variables and giving us more individualistic inputs. Uh, we've got a circular economy discussion going on and we've got environmental conscious design going on, right? So I'll give you some time to think about your responses and I'm gonna to jump to Viren. Viren, from an architectural and design standpoint, how do you see things changing over the next, I, I'm not talking about futuristic, I'm not talking about science fiction, I'm talking about in the next maybe 20, 25 years, how do you see this design dialogue going? Can I have some of the pictures for this? Um, yes, see, the pictures that I'm showing, uh, it doesn't mean that I advocate this. I must admit that, first of all. And there's a, there's a very clear position that I have myself, which is very much what Dr. Shelley said about darkness being as essential as light. And uh, what also Amardeep said about beyond homocentricity. 
I share with them both these aspects fully. But when I look at public buildings and the, the, the kind of trend that we are seeing, and the trends certainly are governed today by people who have money, by people who have enough uh, driver from the economy to create. Uh, this is now the Google headquarters. You are all familiar with this. Uh, now, one can suspect two things about this quarter. This is not a very new idea, by the way. Bucky Fuller um, in the 60s and Fry Otto in the 70s have dwelt on these kind of concepts. And they have been able to build also their beautiful concepts in Mannheim, the Rose Garden coverage, which is with these membrane structures. So what I see here, but happening in future is that this membrane that is covering complete neighborhoods that are covering um, maybe also, though I don't want to be so dark, but maybe covering also against the pollution that we have created in our environment and creating a kind of uh, inner, inner world that is protected against high UV radiations and other, other impacts from the environment that we have damaged. So it's a little dark that way. And uh, interesting is also this carries on further with not Foster's proposal for the for the airport in Mexico, where suddenly, and this is certainly a derivative of the cathedral that we saw earlier, where suddenly the wall disappears and the roof becomes the wall and the wall becomes the roof. So we are talking here of morphing a futuristic architecture where daylight is, like Dr. Shelley said, it's in so much of abundance that there is no there is no darkness anymore left. But one has to understand also these are transitory spaces. These are not habitable spaces as such. And the other layer that comes in it has to do with how do you, how do you achieve uh, a model? And here we see Cloud9 with their proposal where the entire facade becomes like a, uh, I would say like a, like a um, animated, animated engine uh, referring to a uh, certain uh, understanding of, of nature where you can manipulate, and this is in all term, a very dynamic facade where the entire thing changes with the temperature, with the daylight, and starts becoming more like an organism. So I would say future probably is driving technology to do not biomimicry as we knew it from the past, but something that comes closer maybe to a flower that closes at night, opens up through photosynthesis of the leaves, is able to generate also its own energy. So self-sustenance of a building could be a very interesting future to look into. Wow, Amar, you've got your act cut out for you. So while we got there, um... Walls becoming ceilings, more transparencies, lighter material, lighter both in terms of materiality, but also allowing a more profusion of light, controlled and modulated. Uh, we're also talking about flexible membranes. So plan your response while we hear Harshita's response to Dr. Shelley. Go, Harshita. Uh, so uh, the question was about how, what is the future of lighting, right? Uh, in because of the current situation and how everything is changing today. Uh, firstly, uh, I think the future is in, uh, interesting because right now everyone knows what is the perfect lighting for uh, good facial illumination. My non-lighting designer friends are talking about uh, good color rendition and good CRI and what is the correct uh, frontal illumination and stuff like that. Okay, but anyway, go, jokes apart. I think... Um, the future is definitely about flexible working spaces, right? Uh, what we have learned through the pandemic is that you don't have to go to work and to be productive. You can be productive at home. So I think lighting has to take a cue from where um, people are moving towards um, today. And I think post-pandemic, a lot of things may not change, uh, go back to before, right? Like maybe you don't need a 100% workforce. So maybe 50% of the people will be working at home. So I think it's important for the lighting to cater to the people who want to work at home or people who, who work in the office, right? So I think flexible lighting schemes, which can really, uh, you know, uh, work well, you know, in the morning, if you have, you need to have a task lighting or in the even, evening, if you want to have ambient lighting, I think lighting is going to help in that way going forward uh, in the future. And um, yeah, I think that's where I, uh, I think the future of lighting lies in. How would you react to one of the things that Dr. Shelley was mentioning where uh, she was showing this variable, right? Yeah. Where uh, yeah. you get information about your light diet for the day, 
right? Yeah. And whether you've got enough or not enough. How yeah. would you sort of like put that into the mix? So I want to be uh, very optimistic and believe that everyone will understand how much uh, the effect of light pollution or over consumption of light, how much it impacts people, uh, because it cannot be just a group of lighting designers or interior designers who understand it. I think it's uh, good that Dr. Shelley is bringing up this topic so that it's it's educating more people and it's going to be a huge win for uh, I don't know how uh, people will use it, but it's going to be a huge win if people do want to wear those sensors. And if they are aware that, uh, you know, they're over lighting or they, you know, um, or, or, or they're using more consuming more than what is required. So I think uh, this is an awareness that's going to get created. I don't know. Uh, I would really hope that in the next few years, people do, you know, understand what, how it's affecting the nature and how it's affecting ecology. Uh, so, yeah, so I think. That's a, actually I didn't know about this light sensor that you can wear. So thank you so much about uh, thank you so much for telling me about this uh, thing. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Shelley, you're muted. Shall I shall I share a link on the chat or? Yes, yes, please. Yes, sure. you could. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Could loose technologies. Um, yeah. Give me a. There you go. So we have a light meter on the phone, so we sort of use that. But yeah, I think something which is wearable is much easier. And uh, maybe it can come onto your Apple Watch. I mean, like any other parameter that you uh, gauge, that, that's a really cool thing. Yeah. So it's interesting that you've sort of brought in this different aspect to it, because here um, they're actually looking at the amount of light that you need so that in case you're deficient, you sort of make sure that you step out okay. into the sun to get a little bit in. Yeah. But I think it's yeah. important to sort of um, understand the usage to make sure that it, it doesn't just end up becoming a very individual device again allowing us to do our own um, you know our own selfish things with that but sort of integrate that into a composite whole with regard to information sharing with those around us to see how best we can use those places i think that that's yeah. one key takeaway yeah. amar your response to uh Viren look at the future of architecture how do you see that impacting light and what we do as lighting designers uh, can I share a very uh, short parallel story from my own life and then maybe try to relate that to this whole uh, complex question? Sure. Now, um, I'm, I'm health conscious and I was very uh, conscious about how healthy I am. So, and I found out that my body mass index was higher. My body mass index is an indicator of how your weight should be as per your height. And I... Uh, Amar, we've lost you. I realized that I was about eight kilos overweight compared to achieve that. So a year and a half back, I joined a CrossFit training exercise, HITT, all kinds of, you know, you see all this on the internet and you think you need to do all those exercises. But somehow, one and a half years down the line, I was just not able to achieve that real, my, my weight was still 75 kilos. And then the lockdown happened and I couldn't go to the gym. And I had to look for alternate ways of um, trying to get fit. And I found out this online yoga instructor course and I registered for it. It was a two months online course. And I was doing yoga practice for two months. And within three months, I lost eight kilos. And I achieved my uh, body mass index that I have to achieve. What I did find about yoga is that yoga is a draw, a simple inspiration. It is, I didn't have to go high tech. I just had to look at simple, very simple asanas of yoga, which are mimicry of nature. So when you do these asanas, which are actually, there's this downward dog position, that is the chameleon position. And all these are just a mimicry of nature. Now I try to bring that to lighting design, all these wonderful architecture that we talk about. If you could just simply draw inspiration from nature. How is bioluminescence working? How is this whole aspect of Dr. Shelley saying that light sensor? There are insects, there are snakes, there are plants. They have inbuilt light sensors within themselves, which tell them how much light they need, how much when they need to switch off. So that's a direct inspiration from nature. So I think the answer lies in nature, as the future should be how in sync are we with nature? How in sync are we with the whole practice? and this whole biodynamism of nature. I think that would be the future of architecture, that would be the future of lighting design, and that would be the future of sustainable biodynamic living. That's how I would say. Poetic and impactful.
what a wonderful way to bring the session to a close. I think a biodynamic, it is, it is quite evident from our discussion, is, is beyond just understanding light and its uh, sort of actions are on, on our own well-being, but also understanding how nature has sort of grown, thrived, and flourished, as you say. And there are lots of lessons that we can actually take from it. The cycle of the sun being just one of them and the way it is sort of hardwired into our brain. But by understanding how different mechanisms sort of create light, use it, and share it, I think that's the key sort of takeaway from this process. And, and if we are able to sort of initiate that into our design discussions, I think we we are on a good road, right? Thank you very much. I think this has been a, a really amazing discussion. Thank you very much for your time. And um, we will continue to share notes with the team uh, and taking uh, this discussion forward. Thank you very much, Viren, for your time, Dr. Thank Shelley. You. Thanks a lot, Harshita. And Thanks. always wonderful to have you on the panel, Amar. Thank you. Bye-bye. All the best. Thank Take you. care.